the discussion on the topic of war in Ukraine organized by the Institute of Political and International Studies. Uh, I am Kinga Schur, the lecturer of the Institute, and I am the host of today's discussion. So our, our schedule for today is the following. First, John Sabo conducts a presentation entitled The Questions of Energy Policy. John is the lecturer of the Institute and also an expert of energy policy and the research fellow at the Center for Economic and Regional Studies of the Institute of World Economics. So he's really a specialist of this topic. And after the presentation, we open a Q&A section. So without wasting any more time, I give the floor to John Sabo. Uh, thanks so much, Kinga. Um, the, the, the specialist is, is quite strong, I feel, in, in these turbulent times um, when I'm just uh, running, running with the events and trying to make sense of it all. Um, but it's been challenging, to say the very least. Um, so hopefully um, I shared my slides and then I'll just pop that onto a full screen. There we go. So uh, yeah, it's it's been turbulent. It's been hectic. Um, there have been so many questions continuously arising. Um, and uh, is it is it sharing right now? Because um, it says for some reason that I paused. Uh, Cool. Uh, so you guys sh see my shared screen. Is that, is that correct? Um, Kinga, can you give me a? Yes, yes, yes we can. Okay, cool. Sorry. Um, so yeah, um, thinking about energy policy has been quite challenging over the past couple of uh, days um, for for a variety of reasons. Um, it's it's become this crucial issue that that continuously pops up in all the discussions, and I think um, the first sort of point that I would uh, I would like to articulate is that. Um, the conflict itself for um, many of us, it may be trivial that it's not necessarily about energy, but energy is a crucial and inimical point to the conflict itself and how it develops and how it can be um, sort of resolved ultimately. Um, there are a bunch of better theories, I think, um, that have a grander or larger explanatory value over why precisely the events unfolded the way that they did and uh, how they are unfolding and how they may re be resolved. This is not to say that energy is not a very important component, as we'll see, given the sort of turbulence that it has led to on global energy markets uh, with this direct impact on the European Union and generally um, how um, Russia stands in the sort of global economy and, and, and the functioning of it. So I just want to put that out as a sort of disclosure. Um, to sort of facilitate and help um, our understanding um, and, and, and to draw a sort of theoretical framework, a key premise um, um, that, that I, that I want to build upon is, is, is actually twofold. One of the dynamics that um, is the European Union in, Union in itself is embedded in a broader economy that can be described or, or that's been described as a sort of petroculture. In this context, the point of departure um, is one in which fossil fuels and their consumption is, is deeply embedded in the way that society functions, the way that it operates, the way that we shape social relations, economic ties, political ties. So it is so deeply enmeshed in it, making um, it very, very challenging to sort of pivot away from it very quickly and resolve what seem to be very trivial matters. The other and closely intertwined element of it is because energy is embedded in this broader context of a petrol culture, um, it is not a simple commodity that can be substituted, but it has um, that element of being a tradable and a fungible commodity, but simultaneously it's also a public good. Um, due to the need that we need to heat uh, um, homes, that uh, we need to power um, vehicles and, and its various other uses, leading it to be sort of being, becoming securitized by um, a number of governments, um, states shaping the way that we relate to it. So the, these two facets of it just sort of begin to underscore the challenging nature of shifting the way that we consume energy and, uh, and sort of showing how difficult it is not only to move away, but to begin to think about alternative ways, ways of consuming 
and thereby intervening in a manner that may ultimately lead to some sort of uh, negative ramifications. And as we'll see, this is sort of crucial um, in the way that sanctions are designed in the European Union and how various countries are sort of willing to intervene and relate to this conflict and its resolution um, is, is, is ultimately crucial. Um, and just uh, to, to, to underscore the point, right, uh, given um, the size and its intensity within the European um, economy um, is exemplified best by the Rotterdam port, where you have European the, the EU's effectively largest uh, refineries there um, with these huge tankers coming and going on a daily basis and delivering, amongst other things, um, Russian fossil fuels um, into the European Union. So what, what's the picture that we're looking at? Obviously, most of my discussion points are going to be from the position of the European Union and looking at how we can respond and how the European Union has responded and how it's been impacted by these, given the intertwined nature and its reliance on Russian energy. Um, which, uh, sort of succinctly put, it, it's high. It's, it's very, very high, and that makes it all the more troubling and all the more difficult. Um, but why is it important, and how high is it? Maybe sort of two questions that one, one may ask. Um, when we look at coal, um, that's a simpler story that I'm not going to look at in depth. Um, actually, the European Union imports close to half of its coal um, from, um, uh, from Russia. Um, here, the, uh, it's easier to substitute it. Um, there's a declining role of coal in the economy. Um, its, its prices have been able to sort of weather the storm a little better, um, making it a little bit less interesting in a sense and also less discussed. Um, simultaneously, um, due to um, a decline in the prices of, of uh, carbon dioxide quotas, um, it, it, it has sort of dampened uh, the, the spikes in, in, in coal. Uh, when we look at crude oil, which is one of the, the dimensions where, where, um, where it gets a little more challenging um, to, to move away from Russian uh, sourced volumes, um, effectively 27% of crude oil comes from Russia, um, in addition to which we rely on petroleum products. So um, diesel is especially prominent in this, um, heavy um, uh, fuel oils are very important uh, import products. But even when we look at the broader picture, um, in the case of lighter products, such as NAFTA, which is primarily used to sort of blend gasoline and, and produce um, plastics, um, the reliance may directly be less, but the ramifications of reducing Russian imports um, sort of ripples throughout the global economy, um, pushing up prices and making it increasingly difficult and costly um, to, um, to, put, uh, to, to move away from this reliance on it. And arguably the most discussed um, topic uh, has been natural gas. Um, here, to see, uh, here too we see that there's effectively uh, just over 40% reliance of total consumption on, on Russian imports. Um, depending on how statistics are accounted, um, it, it kind of changes somewhere between 38 and 43% um, are, are roughly the numbers that I've heard. Um, of that basically um, you have 140 billion cubic meters coming in through pipeline. Uh, and another 15 billion cubic meters coming um, in through LNG. Just to put that into context, right, um, total European consumption would be somewhere around 500-ish. Uh, uh, so um, these volumes are, are quite substantial in, uh, in, in when we look at the overall import portfolio of, uh, of, 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 of the European Union from Russia. So have we seen this? This is the question that I've been asking myself in, in, in uh, sort of turning to what sort of historical anal uh, analogies we can look at. And uh, we've sort of seen this. Um, obviously, the intensity, the combating are, are fundamentally different dynamics. But um, in terms of how energy supplies may be impacted, um, there have been cases that resemble the current case in some shape or form, um, which I think is useful to sort of briefly revisit. Um, there had already been in the 2000s a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which sort of jeopardized or, or led to risks around um, supplies and the continuity of them. Uh, in 2006, there wasn't a full haul to natural gas supplies, but there was a reduction in volumes. Um, that was sort of eased over um, between, between the partners. Um, and then in 2009, uh, supplies halted for, uh, for two weeks. Um, leaving a lot of especially Bulgarian, Bosnian, Serbian households in the cold for, for quite a bit. It was a quite uh, severe winter that, that year around. So 
Um, we've seen these being halted, and here it, may, it must be noted that the risk is that supplies will be halted. They have not been, uh, flows have been continuous, um, but there's a real um, political risk over um, Russia sort of weaponizing um, its, its, its flows. And what were the responses uh, to that uh, back in the time? Uh, after 2009, basically this sort of securitization discourse proliferated. There was there's very intense debates over how the European Union should address the matter, what it can do and how it can tackle the matter. Um, at that time, most of the focus was on implementing the third energy package, which effectively allows for a market to be built and, and engineered to allow for the flows of, of natural gas to, to more swiftly go from country to country. And the presumption was that the establishment of a properly working functioning free market and some additional infrastructure that allows for access to alternative markets um, uh, non-russian markets will sort of help the eu balance the risks um, so in that case um, governments didn't really look at the demand side of things they didn't really look some energy efficiency matters were implemented but most of the focus was on building additional pipelines and uh, after um, a couple of years after 2009, um, effectively the, the sort of push to pivot away from Russian natural gas uh, sort of subdued and it declined over time. And even after the illegal annexation of Crimea, when related concerns emerged once again, um, there wasn't really uh, the substantial move away from natural gas did not yet emerge. Um, the response here was some reversal of, of sort of embracing the free market and to looking for a more um, centralized, more direct intervention um, from, uh, from the European Union. Um, but here too, um, it was only a couple years afterwards, so around 2016, when increasingly the role of natural gas would be questioned. At that point, that would rather come on climate grounds as opposed to um, Russia's intervention in Crimea. So the, the, the sort of morale of the story that in previous cases when, when uh, risks would emerge and increase, um, the focus was overly on mitigating supply risks, introducing additional pipelines, facilitating the development of new contract forms, so on and so forth, um, not reducing uh, demand and uh, not pivoting away from uh, Russian supplies. So why are things different now and what alternative paths of action do we actually have or can we pursue are, are two things that I've sort of spent my uh, past couple of, uh, past week or so um, sort of um, exploring. And here I'll try to provide a brief snapshot of what's happened with regard to these two larger markets or field, if you, um, if you will, um, be that oil and, uh, and natural gas on the hand, other hand. So when we think about oil, it's uh, one need only sort of turn on Bloomberg TV or something to, to quickly get the message that oil is a global commodity. Um, it's, it's this big top um, of floating vessels all over the ocean into which a bunch of countries add their oil and a bunch of countries take out the oil that they need. And this sort of very well um, working uh, market will help dampen any sort of supply risks and, and, it, and it overcomes it. So, so the buffer is there. And what this leads to is that there are apparently no regional problems around that because there are no direct linkages and, and, and uh, oil can be substituted in, in some shape or form. And this, from a sense, is indeed true, um, but there are differences between oil and oil. Um, one of these dimensions is the specific physical and the material qualities of the oil, um, such, such as um, viscosity, um, sulfur content, um, which leads different regions and different refineries to pursue and look for alternative oils and look for specific oils. Um, but also what we've seen is that the introduction of various sanctions that target, um, may not target um, Russian energy directly, but the targeting of financing instruments and financing institutions and insurances and tankers, um, these um, impede the ability of certain uh, countries to purchase specific oils or certain companies um, are limited in their willingness to um, pursue and buy Russian oil because they fear that they will be sanctioned somehow. So I think the, the, the very um, 
in, well, interesting is quite clinical um, given the given the setting, but um, the effect of U.S. and European sanctions have been so effective um, because of the sort of ambiguity. And what this has led to is a sort of state where um, companies are sort of over sanctioning. They're willing to uh, they go beyond um, the written out sanctions um, that have been implemented in law and in policy simply in fear of losing business in the Western world. And uh, we've seen that European, Japanese and South Korean companies have been very, very reluctant to touch any sort of cargoes um, that may be linked to, to Russian oil and, and, and Russia in general. And it leads to this weird situation where, um, as, as you see on the right, um, that the price of Brent crude um, has basically shot through the roof and is above $125, uh, it was around 130 yesterday um, per barrel, while you have tankers filled with Russian crude sort of floating on the ocean because nobody wants to buy it. So there's this mismatch between demand and supply that is skewed by 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 um, the general concern over consuming these uh, these uh, these volumes and sort of adding uh, to that was was uh, the presumed U.S. and then the U.K. also joined the ban on Russian oil. Um, here it should be underscored that. The U.S. and the U.K. are relatively self-reliant on, on their oil. Um, they, they, they've got ample production at home. The U.S. is independent. Um, Russian oil plays a very minuscule role. Uh, I think it's about 3% of, of total U.S. demand. Um, so it's pretty easy from that position to sort of ban Russian crude, whereas on the other hand, you have uh, the European Union of, of relying at basically 27% of, of, uh, of their consumption on Russian crude. In addition to which, you have um, you have the uh, the petroleum products as well. Um, that basically leads to um, somewhere in between uh, three to eight million barrels per day uh, of oil being impacted. Um, to put that into context, global demand for oil is is somewhere around 100 barrels per day. So uh, somewhere around a twentieth to a tenth. Um, has been impacted and there has been a reluctance by traders and, and by a number of entities to sort of uh, touch the Russian oil, which is one of the reasons that, for instance, Brent prices, Brent is the oil that is produced on the uh, in the Northern Sea, so predominantly UK and, and, uh, and uh, Norway um, territories, um, is uh, th their prices have shot up. And in comparison to that, we've seen that Urals, which is the predominant uh, oil um, that Russia exports, um, is, is about $25 cheaper than that. The margin between the two, um, you know, three weeks ago, that was about three, four, five dollars. And now it's shot up to 25, which is this, it, it just underscores the difficulty of sort of selling that Russian crude and uh, and uh, getting it to market. So what it, what it also shows is that it is indeed an integrated uh, market, but the dynamics of it are, are not so clear cut and its ability to clear itself is not, not quite, um, quite there and is naturally impacted by uh, such instability. And so where does this lead us um, if we sort of want to look forward? Um, you know, high oil prices are, are here to stay. Um, uh, Ongoing is, 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 the, um, is the annual sort of gathering of oil executives in Houston right now, actually. And uh, most of the presenters had sort of reached a consensus where oil prices may well continue to increase, um, depending on how long the, um, the, the sanctions stay in place, how long the fighting uh, continues. Um, and, and a lot of them were not reluctant to state that, that um, uh, the, the main uh, grades of, of crude oil may very easily reach 150 to 200 dollars a barrel, um, which formerly has been unimaginable. So right now, amongst traders and states alike, there's a scurry to sort of figure out where we're going to get every single barrel that we can sort of bring online. And there are a couple of sort of parallel tracks that one may want to consider when, when looking at um, where you can get additional barrels of oil. One of them is Iran, um, which uh, sort of right now the, um, the U.S. administration is in, is in negotiation to, to, um, to uh, uh, re-sign sort of a version of the Iran uh, nuclear deal. 
and bring that additional crude online. Here, um, given the advanced nature of the talks, um, actually the upside to Iran adding uh, new volumes of crude is, is actually quite limited, um, simply because um, it's already been exporting. In the past couple of months, uh, Iranian oil has sort of reached international markets. So there's a question of how much additional volumes that will that will uh, entail. Venezuela, another another interesting case. Um, you know, the U.S. was was in heated disputes with Venezuela a couple of weeks and months ago. Uh, last week, it sent a pretty high level delegation to talk with them to see uh, what volumes we can we can bring online. Canada has offered to to bring additional um, volumes online as well. Um, the question and the continuous question with regard to um, to these cases is, is at what price? And um, the picture over here of Fort McMurray is reflective that in the case of Canada, by uh, including and, and adding more of that to the volume, you're, you're simply um, adding to that environmental destruction, which um, as is quite clear here, um, uh, is, is visible from, from Google Maps effectively. Um, and, and they, they yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but we cannot see your current slide. So we can see the first slide. And oh, now shit. it became clear that <laughs> you proceeded. Uh, that's odd. Um, hold on. Let me let me reshare that. Um. Uh, how about now-ish? It's still working. Okay, perfect. So now you guys see Fort McMurray um, to, 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 the, to the right. Um, okay, well, you didn't miss out much. I didn't have a lot of pictures then earlier on, but hopefully now it's, it's visible. Um, yeah, so it's just a chart. Sorry. Uh, yeah, there's there's an additional element of sort of Saudi Arabia um, bringing in additional volumes, uh, UAE as well, the US, and also strategic reserves. Right, since uh, effectively the 1970s, when when the oil crisis struck, um, a lot of the oil importing countries uh, signed a memorandum to to have strategic about three months worth of consumption in strategic reserves. Um, some have been added to the market uh, a couple of days ago. There was there was a lift from the strategic reserves, um, but that's been minuscule. So these are all the sort of corners of the world where um, policymakers are now, now sort of scrambling, and traders are looking to to um, gather a little a little a little bit of oil. What may be a little bit surprising to some extent is, is that OPEC plus, which is the OPEC countries, uh, most of them are, are, are Middle Eastern countries, and then you have Venezuela in there as well, um, uh, plus Russia, um, are, are actually still resilient, um, given the volatility of, of oil markets, um, which is something that Saudi Arabia, which is the most dominant voice in OPEC generally, and, and one of the most prominent producers of oil, um, one of its historically sort of strategic objectives has been to stabilize oil prices and therefore it will be interesting to keep an eye on for how long Saudi Arabia will sort of look at these um, uh, this sort of volatility um, because there is a very real risk that high prices will force some consumers to look to alternatives to oil. Um, it makes all sorts of alternative energy sources uh, much more appealing um, anything from renewables through even nuclear and, and a bunch of other sources of energy. Um, so Saudi Arabia will probably be concerned at some point that um, oil is too expensive um, and, and its main product um, uh, may, may, may face risks. Um, and then we can also look at the long term implications. Uh, one of the sort of uh, quite drastic developments was international oil companies, so IOCs, pulling out of Russia limiting um, domestic companies access to both capital and technology. Um, capital, you can probably still figure out how, how to work that. Technology, that's a little more challenging. And that's probably one of the reasons that the Russian oil and gas sector should be very concerned. Um, it currently actually needs a pretty strong wave of investment in order to um, facilitate the development of oil and natural gas fields. Because these are quite up high, uh, up north, 
uh, and very severe uh, offshore cold, terrible conditions generally for, for us humans, um, it, it's very, very difficult to drill there. And that's where they need Western technology. With the sanctions and the sort of uh, general consensus to, to, to leave Russian uh, markets, um, it leaves them in a very challenging position, which not only limits Russia's ability to, to access oil um, down the road in a couple of years' time, but it may also lead to either other producers sort of taking their market or capturing their market, or alternatively, um, high prices uh, remaining with us, potentially facilitating an energy transition. So that's oil. Um, it's 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 mixed. It's it's uh, it's fuzzy, and and I think everybody's just trying to make sense of it. Um, but when we sort of move on to to natural gas, um, which is which is just as talked about, I think, is uh, you know maybe the first question that's worth considering is that where does that go? Where why do we need natural gas? Why is it important? Um, well, obviously, uh, one of the key elements, and speaking from Hungary, where, which is very reliant on it for heating, um, is, is one, of, one of the actual forms of demand. Um, the second, probably most important source is electricity generation. It's usually, it's very important in meeting that last incremental bit of electricity. So that very last light bulb that we turn on, um, is, is, it, it comes from, um, from natural gas. So you need it to sort of balance out all the other forms of supply. Um, in order to meet, meet that sort of demand. Um, and therefore, it plays a pretty important role in shaping how expensive electricity is. Um, through this, it can have a very dire impact, um, as we've seen given the already ongoing sort of energy crisis in the past year. And, uh, and thirdly, industrial consumption. Um, so to maintain the competitiveness of, of Europe's uh, industry is, uh, is, is very much reliant on, uh, on allowing for um, natural gas prices to be accessible to producers. Where does it come from? Um, it comes from Russia, a large chunk of it, as I mentioned, effectively 40% of demand. Um, we've got additional imports from Norway. Domestic European production is tiny, it's minuscule, it's not, and it's declining. Um, then we have some imports from North Africa, um, so a combination of Algeria and, and uh, Libya. And then we have a bunch of liquefied natural gas, which is basically natural gas cooled to minus 163 degrees, put into a ship, shipped wherever, and then reheated. Um, so that's basically an alternative way to access it. What this allows for is to access um, geographies and markets that are not necessarily connected by pipeline. So anything from Qatar to Australia can, in theory, um, ship to uh, to the European Union. And uh, the uh, interestingly enough, there has been a debate, um, and and most of my dissertation actually focuses on this. So um, so this in itself is a another um, quite rich topic that I can passionately discuss for hours, but I won't. Um, is uh, how this relates to climate. There has been a questioning and a sort of uh, uh, a sort of discussion over natural gas having a role to play in the EU's energy transition. And effectively, coming out of the Paris Agreement and introducing policy afterwards, there was some indication that natural gas's role may be pl uh, limited, and it won't play the role of a quote-unquote transition fuel, which would allow European society to move from coal uh, to renewables. So it would be the sort of middleman, simply because it was understood to be the least emitting source of uh, energy. And that sort of, there was a very strong push afterwards from producers, all sorts of companies that uh, provide the gas, so be that Norwegian Equinor or um, Russian Gazprom, to include it somehow. Um, where we see this is, is, a, is a push towards the acceptance of hydrogen, which is very much natural gas based, um, the introduction of taxo uh, taxonomy rules in the European Union, which allows for natural gas project to um, sort of remain included or capacity reserve mechanisms, which allows for natural gas to continue to play a role in electricity generation in a more economic form. And uh, when we look at the other side of, of the equation, then, then we also see what I uh, briefly mentioned is that Russia urgently needs to take decisions over um, investments into natural gas fields. And uh, for this, and this is one of the reasons that it's so pivotal 
um, as to um, these events happening right now is that um, it sort of um, amplifies the need to make a decision. Do we go the natural gas way or do we avoid it? Um, on the European level, there was a sort of um, the, the scale was sort of tipping towards we can include it to some extent, but with a lot of reservations. But the Russians also needed some sort of um, reaffirmation of uh, can we include it or, or, or should we leave it out in order to make those investment decisions. Now that scale is sort of tipping. And um, that's a key point is that um, the um, what has happened in, in the past couple of weeks has led all of the policymakers and trading houses and so on and so forth to look at this fundamentally changed landscape over how we perceive natural gas. And it just speaks to, to how, how quickly um, that sort of sense of seeking uh, energy security can shift and how we can shift the emphasis from something that was sort of deeply embedded into society and reconsider that role given the intensity of, of the crisis. And I think this is why, what, is, what is so exciting um, in terms of how quickly this happened effectively. Um, so one of the largest projects around this Nord Stream 2 was effectively halted right away after the invasion. I think it was a day or two afterwards, um, which has been in this tussle between the West and, and Russia for, for, for years now effectively. Um, but what can, what can the EU do given its reliance on, on natural gas? And this is what a lot of policy makers have been act, uh, asking themselves is what alternatives do they have? And over here um, on, on my right, hopefully um, you guys see it, is, um, is uh, effectively alternative routes and ways in which we can access that natural gas and alternative markets. Because one half of the story is how do we import it? Do we have the available sort of pipeline capacities um, with which we can access it? Um, and the numbers show that effectively there's still some room. We can uh, look to additional flows from Azerbaijan or North Africa um, because the pipelines allow for that. The same goes for LNG. So in principle, um, the European Union can turn to higher import volumes from uh, through Belgium, France and, and Italy uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but then we have the problem of who puts that gas in there? And that's where things become a little trickier because um, those sort of additional volumes are not necessarily in place or can't be ramped up very quickly. Um, so in the case of uh, Azerbaijan, the upside is very limited. Um, in the case of Algeria or Libya, there is some upside and, and the European Union has been calculating with that. Um, and when we look at LNG as well, that's also one of the questions and already um, if you've been following the news that you've may, you may have heard that, I think it was about a month ago when, when the Russia-Ukraine crisis began to escalate, uh, the U.S. sent a pretty high-level delegation to Qatar to see if Qatar, as the largest exporter of LNG, could supply additional um, cargoes to, you, to the European Union. The short answer is probably not a lot more. And also, um, it would have to, the European Union buyers would have to sort of... Um, compete with Asian buyers. So obviously there is, there's very strong demand in other parts of the globe, um, in China especially. Japan is very reliant on these cargoes, uh, South Korea as well. Um, so can we outbid them? And, and this is one of the key points that um, whatever's going to happen, it's going to cost a lot. And, and I think that was one of the elements of the discussion that we just had before um, uh, opening up the, uh, the, the, the team's uh, platform to, to the audience. Is, is, is how costly this is going to be. Um, alternatively, if we can find some volumes, we'll have to pay for it. And also there'll be this ethical dimension of can we t sort of outbid um, buyers in the global south, which we are in a position to do because of the economic well-being. But then again, um, you're effectively um, taking the fuel from the Philippines and, and a bunch of other countries who are reliant on the imports and causing problems there. So there's that dimension too that, that I think should carefully be considered. Um, there are alternative fuels um, to shift to. Some of these power plants can be shifted to oil, for instance, which again is costly, but technically feasible. Um, there is uh, a, 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 an ability to restart a couple of coal power plants. Um, if things get bad, um, 
again, it's a matter of weighing sort of the, the additional emissions that would lead to versus the, the sheer need to meet energy um, demand. The good news is storage levels are quite good. Well, the, coming out of the winter, it, it, the winter hasn't been too severe. Um, so we should be okay um, through the summer. Um, the problems may begin next week, uh, next, uh, next fall, uh, next winter, um, if um, supplies are halted for some reason. Um, and when we look at the other side, um, in the short term, Russia should be fine. I mean, they've developed a pretty strong uh, reserve currency um, base and, and, and prepared themselves economically to some extent. Um, so, so in that sense, they're okay. The problems there that, um, that we'll see, and one of the reasons that Russia will be reluctant to halt supplies for a longer period of time is that it can't really do anything with the natural gas. So uh, a natural gas field doesn't necessarily work like a tap, which you can simply turn on or off, um, because if you turn it off uh, for a longer time, you may fundamentally damage that sort of geological formation, um, not allowing it for it to be restarted. So there is a reluctance on both parties to, to um, halt supplies. So basically, that can sort of lead to the presumption that, um, you know, in the short to midterm, it'll be very costly for the EU. I don't think there are a lot of questions. But in the long term, without alternative markets to access, Russia will lose this huge source of revenue that it currently relies on. If we consider that oil and natural gas revenues make up about, uh, up about I think it's about 8% of Russian GDP, then that puts it into context of how important this is for Russia and to maintain uh, its economy. And when we consider the historical context and that shapes um, uh, the, the way that we can act is that the energy transition is now, it's on its way. In 2009, it was, it was next to nowhere. Um, there was some wind in Germany, basically, and that's, that's the end of the story. But since then, there has been this huge push to deploy. Um, these solar PVs were, um, uh, I photographed them uh, by the Matra power plant up in uh, northern Hungary, and you're seeing these popping up everywhere. Wind is becoming cheaper. Um, electricity grids are being expanded to facilitate the deployment of these technologies. Batteries are coming around. So you have a whole lot of um, both uh, technological tools, but also policy tools. And, and there's a clear focus through the European Green New Deal and, and all sorts of um, alternative policy frameworks with which you can push this transition. And I think the key point here is that we don't need to fundamentally change the direction that the European Union is, is, is heading in. What we need to do is to accelerate it, um, is, to, is to quickly figure out how we can deploy it. Um, the most of it. And effectively, a couple of days after the whole crisis sort of emerged, the uh, International Energy uh, Agency came up with a plan of how we can uh, we can sort of uh, address the issue. And as, as I've sort of walked through these, um, there's the element of reducing reliance on Russia. There's an element of looking to alternative supply. There's an element of looking to uh, minimum storage obligations. But even more crucially are the deployment of, of, of alternative technology, accelerating the wind and solar PV, um, accelerating bioenergy where you can, adding nuclear or, or prolonging um, the phase out of it, um, which apparently in Germany is a no-go still, but we'll see how that changes in a couple of days and a couple of weeks. And that's why I'm saying that everything is just so quickly changing that it wouldn't be actually surprising to see um, how this changes. Um, energy efficiency, heat pumps, so that we have a bunch, there's this very rich toolkit. Um, the key question is how we can figure out how to deploy it very effectively, very quickly, which again is going to be costly, um, but it may actually help us get off of Russian gas um, in, in, in a couple of years time. And Policy um, tools are also being deployed to support this and to acknowledge the issue and to begin to address it and force governments to think about how we can take measures. Two days ago, the Commission came out with the Repower EU, which is roughly along the same lines of the mantra it has been considering, with the exception that natural gas cannot necessarily play the role of the transition fuel anymore, or certainly not Russian natural gas. Um, and all other measures that the Commission has been uh, has been uh, looking to support um, need to be fast-tracked uh, as soon as possible. So just to conclude, 
um, basically the war doesn't fundamentally shape the way that um, the EU's energy policy um, is developed. The pace of it is, is the crucial element. It seems to be that there's a consensus over that the road will be rocky, it will be expensive, things will be volatile um, in the short to midterm and until we get things sort of figured out and, uh, and it's going to be a bumpy ride. But I think there has been warnings over this um, by, by prominent experts. So, so it's not that great of a surprise. The intensity and the context uh, obviously is, is something fundamentally, something that we did not anticipate. Um, and again, uh, the policy and the technical toolkit, the technologies that are at our, at our disposal are much, much richer. So that certainly helps. And the two work together. So um, personally, um, thinking about it as somebody who is deeply committed and engaged with greening the European Union's economy, um, in addition to decarbonizing the global um, society, is, is that this security in a very perverse sense actually allows for the mobilization of political support to enact the measures that we need to, to take um, those very difficult decisions at the end of the day, it's sort of it may be costly right now, but in the long run, it's it's been showed by most climate models that it costs more not to act now as opposed to just waiting it out. And it goes to show just a couple of challenges that we need to sort of address, be that infrastructure bottlenecks, green inflation, social policy, which I haven't really touched upon, but figuring out how we can support those who, who are energy poor, um, what fossil fuels can we use and to what extent are all crucial questions um, that need to be pondered very intensely and I'm sure are, are um, leading to um, policymakers having a lot of sleepless nights um, in Brussels and national capitals throughout the globe. So it's a bumpy ride and quickly, uh, quickly changing, but uh, yeah, I think um, there's a lot of there's a lot of optimism when we consider the path that we're heading down um, in terms of addressing energy security and, and, and climate measures as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.